Math 242, Quest to College. Let's go ahead and do some problems and take care of review five. 8.1 was the first one on our list, and it was a lot, a lot of it was a review. Some stuff in these might be a little new for some of you. Um, you're supposed to solve systems of equations, two equations, two unknowns. And I, I have two problems here. You know, maybe we should just call this problem number one. I kind of made these problems up. Here's problem number two. So with problem number one, the way I was doing these in class is I was saying, let's eliminate one of the letters. And what I'm, to eliminate a letter, you'd like to have opposite coefficients. So you could just add the equations together. Now I'm going to pick to eliminate Y on this because because all I need above is a negative 2 in front of that y, which means I will multiply this top equation by negative 2. So I have 10x minus 2y equals a negative 34. And then the, the bottom equation, I'm going to just leave alone. I'm just going to write it out like this. So I'm going to add those two equations together and I'm going to get 6x, those guys are out of there, equals, this is going to be a negative 12. I divide both sides by 6 and I get x equals negative 2. Then I plug that back into any of these equations. Um, maybe I'll plug it into the top equation before I multiplied it by negative 2. And I end up getting negative 5 times negative 2 plus y equals 17. 10 plus y equals 17. y equals 7. So it looks like, okay, it looks like I have two answers, but it's really just one answer. The answer is an ordered pair, negative 2, 7, and that describes where these two lines meet. They meet at this point right here. Now, they ask us sometimes to classify this. Is this consistent or inconsistent? Well, it's consistent, which means there's at least one solution. They also ask us if this is dependent or independent. Independent means exactly one solution, and that's what we have here. This is independent. So they'll ask you to classify these. Let's go ahead and do problem number two. I'm going to go ahead and eliminate x by putting opposites for coefficients. So I'll multiply the top equation by negative two. When I do that, I end up getting for the top equation, negative 2x plus 4y equals negative 6. And the bottom equation is, actually, I want opposites there, and I multiply by a negative 2. So this will be positive, positive. I want to multiply by a positive 2. Um, and the whiteout, which gives me a negative 4. But kind of interesting when you saw me do the first thing, it looked like I was writing the very same equation. So we'll comment on that. So this is the bottom equation is written like this. And I end up killing off both variables. I get zero equals zero. Okay, so back to what I said. When I multiplied by negative two, I ended up getting exactly the same equation as the bottom equation. These are the same line. This is the same line, which means infinitely many solutions. Now, ha had one of these numbers been a little different and I got zero equals seven, then we would have said no solution, which is inconsistent. But this one is infinitely many solutions. Many. Solutions. Now, some of you are like, okay, that's a good answer. No, it's not. We have to write all the solutions. Now, how do I write all the solutions? Well, all the solutions are all the points on this line. 
So if I were teaching an earlier algebra class, like intermediate algebra, I might just have the students say all the points that are on this line. But because we're in pre-calculus, we want to be more technical about this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign a parameter to one of these letters. Which letter? Well, one way to do it is to go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I'm going to let y equal t. So now the equation says x minus 2t equals 3. x equals 2t plus 3. So that would make the ordered pair look like this. 2t plus 3 comma t. And this answer right here picks up infinitely many solutions because if t is 0 then 3 comma 0 lies on both of those lines, which is really the same line. And if you let t equal 1, then you have 5 comma 1 lies on these as well. Now we're done with this problem, but some of you may have asked, like, what would have happened if I said x equals t? Nothing. You would have just got a different parameterization of the line, whatever that means. Okay, I don't, we've done parametric curves in here. So I would write t minus 2y equals 3. So I would have 2y equals t minus 3. I'm confusing people because I'm switching sides and doing weird things. y equals t minus 3 over 2. So if I had let x equal t, then I would have the answer t comma t minus 3 over 2. 2. And so this right here would also be a legitimate answer for the problem. And um, we'll just stop it right there. I'm just kind of checking my answer through here so the twos cancel. Okay, yeah, so we can have actually this line, okay, so this is really, here's a line here, and this, these are just different parameterizations of that same line. So that completes um, the part of the review for 8.1. I think the new part, or the weird part for people, is when you have infinitely many solutions, and realizing that those are actually, you know, both acceptable. Now when you take the test, don't, like, start writing a whole bunch of them, just pick one parameterization. Now, let's go ahead and do everybody's favorite, 8.2, which is linear systems, three equations, three unknowns. So, how am I going to do this? Well, um, they're, they're going to ask on the test to uh, use matrices to solve this. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up an augmented matrix. Okay, so 1, negative 2, 3, 7, negative 3, 1, 2, negative 5, 2, 2, 1, 3. Now, it's optional whether you want to put a little line here because this line kind of represents the equals and the first column is x's and the second column is y's and the third column is z's. So, you know, like this first equation says x minus 2y plus 3z equals 7. Now, I can draw the ax equals b and get into a little linear algebra, but um, for a review, that might be a little too much. What we want to do is row operations, and we want to use this one right here. Let's highlight it. In yellow, that's my pivot. And I want to put, I want to use that pivot to put zeros underneath, underneath it. Now, how am I going to do that? Well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply row 1 by a positive 3. Because if I do that, I'll have opposites there. So my temporary row 1, which will be in red below the matrix, will be 3, negative 6, 9, 21. I'm going to go ahead and take temporary row 1 and add it to row 2, and that's going to give me a new row 2. Now, in a linear algebra class, they would say, oh, you are um, adding a multiple of one row to another row. And that's what we're doing. And so look what I have. I have 0, so I'm adding those things that I circled in red, and then I have negative 5, and then 11, 
and then what is this going to be? This is going to be 21 minus 5, which is 16. It's easy to like make an arithmetic mistake and then it messes up the rest of the problem. Beautiful, yeah. You know, but the, the deal is, I prefer this over writing a 10,000 page composition in an English class or an essay or whatever they call them. And then you write it and then you get a D minus because whatever, I suck at writing. So let's continue to do this. Now I'm going to use this one, this pivot, to put a zero right there. Now how am I going to do that? Well, I want maybe to multiply row one by a negative two because then I'll have opposites. So let's do that in a different color, not red. I'll do it in blue. So negative two times row one and I have a temporary row one right beneath. So this is negative two, positive four, negative six, negative 14. I'm going to add that to row three and that's going to become my new row three. New and improved, zero. Oh, that's negative 2 plus 2, and then 4 plus 2 is 6, and then I have a negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5, and then I have a negative 14 plus a 3 is negative 11. Okay, so I have a 0 here, and a 0 here, and now I want to put a 0 there, and I'm going to use my negative 5 as a pivot. A lot of linear algebra books will say you got to put a 1 there and then divide everything by negative 5 and get fractions. No, I don't play the game that way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply um, row 2 by a number and row 3 by a number and get opposites. So you know what? You could say, well, what's the LCD, the least common denominator, if those were in denominators? It would be 30. So what I'm going to do is multiply row 2 by a 6 and multiply row 3 by a 5 and let's write these temporary rows underneath so I have 0, negative 30, 66 and 16 times 6 gives me 96. Meanwhile on the bottom row multiplying 5 times the bottom row gets me 0, 30, see that's what I want there, negative 25 and then this is going to be negative 55. I'm going to add those two rows together and that's going to become the new row 3, thus putting a 0 there. So let's see if we can do that. So the last matrix is row equivalent to. Now watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to just write the um, first two rows and un leave them unchanged right there. And then the third row I'm going to get by, by adding those together. So I get 0, 0, and then I have 66 minus 25, which is going to be 41. And then I have a 96 minus 55, which is also going to be 41. At this point, it is very acceptable in this class to say I'm done using the matrix. Now other teachers and a linear algebra class might say, well, you know, you got to make um, these pivots, including this guy right here, you have to make them all ones. Now I could do that and write the matrix again for that one. That would look like 0, 0, 1, 1 because I'd multiply row 3 by 1 over 41. But for this class, this is good enough. Here's your equal sign. Here's x, here's y, here's z. I'm going to write down those equations. So look at the first equation. It says x minus 2y plus 3z equals 7. The next equation says negative 5y plus 11z equals 16. And then the last equation says 41z equals 41. Well, this one I can solve, and I know that this will give me z equals 1. I'm going to plug that back into the middle equation. This is called back substitution, and I get negative 5y plus 11z, well, z is 1, equals 16. Negative 5y equals, I'll subtract 11 on both sides, 5, and y equals negative 1. I'm going to plug 
y equals negative 1 and z equals 1 into this top equation, I'm running out of space on this paper, and I have x minus 2y, 2 times negative 1, plus 3z, 3 times 1, equals 7. x plus 2 plus 3 equals 7. x plus 5 equals 7. x equals 2. Okay, so this solves this linear system. I do not have three answers. I have one answer. It's going to be written as an ordered triple. 2, comma, negative 1, comma, 1. And game over for this problem. Now let's go ahead and do some more problems as we continue here. We'll go into 8.3. And each time I put problems up, you can pause the video and see if you can do the problems yourself. Because that's where it's going to help you the most. So, we have matrices here. Matrices are tables of numbers. And there is matrix arithmetic where we add, subtract, and multiply. There's two kinds of multiplications with matrices. There's scalar multiplication, which you see here. And then there's matrix multiplication, which we'll, um, we'll see um, after this page. So let's go ahead and write out what this is. This is 2 times a, 1, negative 2, 3, 2, negative 1, 4. And then we have minus b, minus this guy right here, 4, 2, negative 3, 1. Now, order of operation says you have to do um, the multiplication first. But let's just think ahead. When you do the multiplication first, um, you're still going to have the same size matrix here. This matrix is really going to be 2 times 3. It is 2 times 2 by 3. So that's rows by columns. So the rows run across and the columns run down. This matrix here is a 2 by 2. In order to add or subtract two matrices, the sizes have to be the same. So on this one, we are kind of done. We're going to say that the answer is not defined. Now, it actually is probably better to say undefined. I believe your book was saying not defined, so I'll just stick with that. Tomato, tomato. I think I like undefined. Let's do the next problem. The next problem, where we're taking a look at this, maybe we should just check the sizes on these matrices first before we write this all out. A is 2 by 3, and so is C. So let's go ahead and write this out. This equals 2 times... A, 1, negative 2, 3, 2, negative 1, 4, and then we have minus C. So I'll just copy down what C is. Once again, you make one little miscopy, it, it kind of ruins the problem. Okay, order of operations, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. I remember my teacher used to say that, and I was like, why does she keep bringing up her Aunt Sally? She's a little personal here in this, in this math classroom. And then I realized later on that she was saying parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, addition, subtraction. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And then, and then I realized, ah, oh, she did not have a, an Aunt Sally. Some teachers will say PEMDAS. Whatever. Let's go ahead and multiply with the scalar. So I'm going to multiply 2 by each of these six numbers. So look, and I'm going to keep them where they are. So this is 2, this is negative 4, this is 6. Then I have 4, negative 2, and 8. I'm going to go ahead and keep everything else in the problem the same. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and subtract. I'm going to go 2. Um, I'm going to subtract corresponding elements. So 2 minus 0 is 2. And then negative 4 minus 3 is negative 7. Then I have a 6 minus a 1, which is 5. If you're, you've got friends who are eavesdropping on you watching this video, they're probably thinking, what math class are you in? Just Are you in arithmetic? Because look, 4 minus a negative 1 is 5, negative 2, minus 2 is negative 4, and then 8 minus 5 is 3. I've actually known lots of students who started off 
with arithmetic at a community college and ended up getting a technical degree where they took all the math classes. So um, there's no, there's nothing wrong with starting off at low at a community college and working your way up to linear algebra. There's the answer to when I go to a minus C. Let's go ahead and do this problem right here. Okay, um, it says B squared, so sometimes the people who haven't done their homework, they, they just want to square all those numbers and say 16, 4, 9, and 1. But we can't do that with matrices. When it says B squared, it says write two copies of these matrices. So the world of matrices is a lot different than the world of just real numbers. It's a non-commutative world for one thing, and we'll, we'll, we've talked about that in lecture. So this is the one where we're talking about the Roadrunner and the Coyote. And this is where we would say you multiply like this. The Roadrunner works on the matrix on the left, and the Coyote drops on the matrix on the right. So we have 16 minus 6, which gives me a 10 for the first one. The next one is 8 plus 2 is 10. Is it always going to be 10? Let's see. Negative 12 minus 3 is negative 15. And then we have negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5. And so this gives me the answer when they ask for b squared. So that was the same B from the last page, if you care, and a lot of you are like, don't really care. Let's move on to the next problem. Okay, so look at this. We have new matrices, D and E. And so, let's go ahead and multiply them together. Now, multiplication works differently. Um, with addition or subtraction, the matrices have to have the same size. With multiplication, it's a little bit more complicated. So let's write these down and see what happens here. 1, 0, negative 2, 4, 3, negative 1. I know in the last problem we did multiply matrices together. We did not do a size check on that. So we'll, um, we'll discuss that as well. So you should always do a size check, even though I did not do it in the last problem. I'll go back and do that after I show you on this one. The size check says this. You write the sizes of the matrices above or below them. So this is a 3 by 2. Um, 3 by 2 rows by columns. And then this one is 2 by 4. Uh, 2. Normally I would just leave that there, but because I'm... Um, PDFing these and putting them on the website, I have to use the whiteout more than I would 2 by 4. Now you can multiply matrices together if the inside numbers are the same. And they are. And your result is going to be a 3 by 4. So going back to the other problem that I did not do a size check on, look at this. Um, I should have done it. Look, this is 2 by 2. This also was 2 by 2, and the inside numbers are the same. The outside numbers tell you the size of your answer. So the size of my answer on this one will be 3 by 4. This one, now when I switch it around like this, well, we'll take care of this one right now. This is a 2 by 4, and D is 3 by 2. So the inside numbers are not the same, so the answer to this one is going to be not defined. Now I did that for a few reasons, one to get it over with, and then another one so I can say I've got a lot more room on this paper to do this problem here. So let's go ahead and multiply the matrices. I should get ready for a 3 by 4 matrix for my answer, because that's what I, I have, 3 by 4, which tells me the size. And let's do Roadrunner and Coyote. This is 2 minus a 0, and this is a 1 plus a 0. And then this is a 3 minus a 0. And the last one is negative 3 plus 0. So there's my first row. Okay, now I have negative 2 and a, my, a negative 4. So I said that wrong. 
I'm going to multiply these together. This is going to be negative 2 times 2, which so that's a negative 4, and a negative 4, which is negative 8. And then I have a negative 2 plus a 20. Make sure that I wrote that down right. Yeah, so this is negative 2 plus 20, which is 18. And then I have negative 6 minus an 8, so that's negative 14. And then this one gives me 6 plus 16, which is 22. Now I bring it over here, and I have um, 6 plus 1 is 7. 3 minus 5 is negative 2. 9 plus 2 is 11. And negative 9 minus 4 is negative 13. And so there it is. We actually saw some applications of multiplying matrices together. Um, so there it is right there. We have our answer. Let me go ahead and put another problem on the sheet that I didn't have, and that would be d squared. d squared is d times d. The size of d is 3 by 2. And then we have another 3 by 2. And so the inside numbers do not match. This one is not defined. So you can only take the square of a square matrix. Let's continue. Jump into 8.5. I think we've been doing some 8.3 and then we'll come back to 8.4 after this problem. Find the determinant of this matrix. So the determinant is something you'll see later on when you do cross product in a physics class or even in a higher math class and when you're doing areas of triangles and linear algebra has determinants all through it. Let's go figure out what the determinant of this matrix is. The first thing is determinants are only linked to square matrices. Square matrices are where the rows equal the columns. And we kind of already went through this, um, you know, in, in, in lecture, so I'm not going to like do this like you've never seen it. You are going to run across a, any row or any column. I'm going to go ahead and go down this middle row or go across the middle row. And to find the determinant of a matrix, you go ahead and write out the numbers. So 0, leave some space. Negative 1, leave some space. 5. Okay, now, their positions are important. The top left corner is always the positive position, and then it looks like checkerboard. So this zero is in the negative position. So I'm going to go ahead and put a negative in front of it. Now it's not going to matter that much, but it does matter on the other numbers. So this guy right here, this negative one is in the positive position. So I'm going to put a plus in front of that. And then this five is in the negative position. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover up all the rows and columns that contain that zero. And I think I had, I was, did it better last time. I had like a, nail file or something and so I get 1 2 1 4 1 2 1 4 now this one doesn't matter because it's really 0 times that so there's a big 0 there I don't even have to do anything else with that the next one is the determinant of these things are called minors, if you care. You cover up the row and the column that has that negative 1 in it, and, you know, so you make a big X, you know, a big cross through that, and you have 3, 2, 2, 4. 3, 2, 2, 4. And then you go over to this one. This is going to be the determinant of a 2x2 two two matrix. That 2x2 two two matrix is gotten by crossing out the row and column that contains that 5. So you're kind of crossing out a capital T that's on its side. And you have 3, 1, 2, 1. Now, to take the determinant of a 2x2 two two matrix, it's just the AD minus BC formula. So let's continue here. We have negative 1, AD, that's 12, minus BC, minus 4. 
And so once again, how did I get that? 3 times 4 minus 2 times 2. And then I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to go 3 times 1 minus 1 times 2. So this is negative 1 times 8. And then this is negative 5 times 1. So this is negative 8 minus 5, which gives me negative 13. Let's go ahead and find the inverse of a matrix, which is 8.4. So 8.4 is where they did this, and there is a quick shortcut for this. Look at this. If your matrix looks like this, A, B, C, D, the inverse is gotten by going 1 over the determinant of your matrix. Then you switch your DNA and negate your B and C. So that's just a formula. We derived that in lecture. So let's go find the inverse of the matrix that we have here. 1 over the determinant. So this is negative 1 times 8 minus 2 times negative 3. Okay, I look up here. This is my um, matrix here. I'm going to switch my DNA. So this is just sort of a recipe, and then negate my B and C, so negate the 2, and, the, and negate the negative 3. So what do I have down here? I have negative 8 plus 6, so this is really 1 over negative 2, times this matrix here. And when we write our inverse matrix, we want to write it all as one matrix. We don't want to have this one, negative 1 half hanging on the outside. So look what we have here. We have negative 4, positive 1, negative 3 halves, and then a positive 1 half. And that is the inverse matrix. And what does this mean? Well, you don't have to care, but it means that this matrix times the original matrix when multiplied together will give me the identity matrix, which is 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay, let's go ahead and do the next problem here from 8.6. So we went 8, 5, we did a problem from 8, 4, which you were only asked to find the inverse of a 2x2 two two matrix in this class. 3x3 three three matrix, then you might as well just be in a linear algebra class. And I don't do that in this class. So find the form needed to begin in the process of partial fraction decomposition. Now on the exam, I would actually spell that all out. Now look at the bottom here. This factor right here is a linear factor raised to the fourth power. And then this factor right here is a quadratic factor raised to the second power. So if I wanted to do partial fraction decomposition, what I would want to do, we'll start off here, we have to build up this linear factor until it builds up to 4. Meaning this, I'm going to go A over the linear factor, plus B over x plus 1 squared, plus C over x plus 1 cubed plus d over x plus 1 to the fourth. Okay, so I built it up. Now, it's a good thing it wasn't a 24 for the exponent, because then I would just say, forget it. I'm not going to be a math teacher anymore. I'm going to go write 10,000 word compositions. Nah, I don't want to do that either. Well, anyways, now we turn it over to the quadratic. So the quadratic, you have to build up to that square, but before you have to, before you write the squared, you have to put the x squared plus 3 before you write this squared here. You have to put that. And on the top, you're not going to put an e only. You're going to say e x plus f. So it's very important that you know your alphabet. There's a little song, but we're not going to go over that. Okay, and so that 
is the first power and then we want to build this up so it says x squared plus 3 squared and so now you need more um, letters of the alphabet and here is G X plus H and we usually like to make those letters you know the A through H be capital now if there was a, a third power there then we would write another term and it would be I X plus J over X squared plus 3 cubed but it's not that's what it was uh, we're not going to solve for those capital letters they just want you to know the rules now we are going to do another one where we will solve for the a and b and c if there's a c but um on this one we're not so let's go ahead and do the next problem 8.6 and i think this had a handout okay so the homework was um, like six problems in the book and a handout that had this now when you do partial fraction decomposition the first thing you want to do is factor the bottom okay so factoring that bottom this is kind of unfair to put in the review but oh well I'm gonna do this anyway because I don't think I'm gonna give you one that's this hard to factor on exam 5 but I wanted some of you to take a walk down memory lane remember when we had to factor things that look like this and there was something called the rational zeros theorem rational zeros theorem and we'll see if it's still yeah, it's still working and the rational zeros theorem says take the um the factors of nine and put them over the factors of one you know here's your constant coefficient here's your leading coefficient so it produces a list the list is going to have plus or minus one plus or minus three plus or minus nine and the rational zeros theorem says that if this polynomial has any rational zeros they will come from this list so let's try out one in in this problem okay i mean we can call this right here f of x just because that's what we like to do when we're math people so f of 1 is 1 minus 5 plus 3 plus 9 now does this give us 0 no this does not equal 0 so then you go through the list negative 1 now you can go through this list and do this using synthetic division but I'm gonna just plug this in here we have negative 1 minus 5 minus 3 plus 9 look at this this one does give us 0 okay so this this makes us happy okay so we're that's like a face there I guess okay that's like a person that's a chin forget it this is why I don't teach art so I'm gonna take this negative 1 and do some synthetic division so on the top I write out the coefficients of the polynomial the one drops down outside the box I multiply inside the box I add multiply add multiply and look it looks like I have just factored f of x into x plus 1 because that negative 1 zeroes that out and then we have this part right here which is x squared minus 6x plus 9 this continues to factor because now we can see that this is x minus 3 times x minus 3 so I'll write that as x minus 3 squared and that is what we want to write the bottom of that fraction with we want it to be all factored so I can do partial fraction decomposition so let us go ahead and say that this thing becomes now you might be wondering what about the top should we factor that no don't factor the top because um, you'll be wasting your time so this factors into x plus 1 we have x minus 3 squared so now it's time to decompose um, we have linear factors this linear factor is raised to the second power so I'm going to write a over x plus 1 that takes care of this guy 
plus, now to take care of this guy, we need two more terms. We need b over x minus 3 plus c over x minus 3 squared. So I've got this equation. I'll put parentheses around this equation. And what am I going to do with this equation? I'm going to multiply it by the LCD. I don't even have room to write it, but I'll, I'll squeeze the LCD right up here. X plus 1, X minus 3 squared. So on the left-hand side, I end up getting 5X squared minus 23X plus 20. Now on the right-hand side, so all of those things canceled, okay? Um, this guy right here, the x plus 1 is going to cancel with that x plus 1, so I'll have a times x minus 3 squared. And then plus b, the x minus, well, this x minus 3 is going to cancel with only one of those. And so I'll have b times x plus 1 times x minus 3. And then I'll have plus C, the X minus 3 squared cancels with that X minus 3 squared, and I'll have C times X plus 1. Now I'm going to go ahead and plug values of X into this equation. So I'll circle this equation because we don't want to lose it. I'll plug values of X into this equation in which it will help me um, kill off some of those variables. So like if I let X equals 3, I'll end up getting 3 squared, which is 9. 9 times 5 is 45. And then I'll have minus 23 times 3, which is minus 69, plus 20. This is going to give you, well, this guy is going to be 0. The next guy is going to be 0. Why is that? Because when you put 3 there, you have 3 minus 3, 0. And then 3 minus 3 is 0, and it zeroes that out. And then over here, I'm going to have C times 3 plus 1, which is 4. So looks like over here I have 65 minus 69. That's going to give me a negative 4. Negative 4 equals 4C. C equals negative 1. Let's go ahead and plug another value of X into that equation that has a circle on it. Maybe X equals negative 1. This is called the chipping away method because you're chipping away and, and solving for each of these letters. Some teachers would say multiply out the right hand side and set up a systems of equations. Very cute, but that's not going to work here. So we have 5 plus 23 plus 20 when I put negative 1 into the left hand side. This is going to give me A times negative 1 minus 3, so that's negative 4, squared. And then these guys zero out because you have a negative 1 plus 1, negative 1 plus 1. So this is plus 0, plus 0. So on the left-hand side, I end up getting... What's that? Did I put negative 1 in correctly? I'm just double-checking this. Yeah, on the left-hand side, I get... 43, 48 equals, this right here is negative 4 squared, which is 16, 16a. So how many times does 16 go into 48? I think it's three times. So we have another number here, a equals 3. Now you might say to yourself, I can't chip away anymore and figure out what B is, but you can. I'm going to go ahead and replace the C with a negative 1, and an A with a positive 3. And now I'm going to let X be whatever I want it to be, and I, I think I can finish the problem here. So maybe not. Uh, I'm just going to use another piece of paper here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and let X equal whatever I want, except do not let it equal negative 1 or 3, because then you'll end up 
killing off the bee, the guy you're trying to find. So x equals 0 is a really good choice because it makes things simple. Look at this. 20 is on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we get um, negative 3 squared, which is 9. 9 times 3 is 27. Over here, you have b times 0 plus 1 times 0 minus 3. And then over here, you have negative 1 times 1. So let's figure out what b is. This is 20 equals um, 27 minus 3b minus 1. The camera just shut off. So this says 20 equals 26 minus 3b. Subtract 26 on both sides, we get negative 6 equals negative 3b. And so what does that tell us about b? b is going to equal 2. So we ended up getting b is 2, a is 3, and c is negative 1. So knowing all that information, our answer is going to be this right here. So let's write our answer down and um, that will complete this problem. So I have a 3 over x plus 1 and then I have plus b which is plus 2 over x minus 3 and then I have plus a negative 1 or I can write it as minus 1. If you put a plus here and put the negative there that's alright and then we have an x minus 3 quantity squared. And there's the partial fraction decomposition because sometimes you're going hunting with your antiderivative gun and this guy will just kick your butt. You won't be able to, to zap him with the antiderivative gun. But if you use some algebra and change him into what he really is, three small cowardly creatures, then you can go zap, zap, zap and find out the antiderivative of this guy and do your calculus. But at this stage in pre-calculus, this partial fraction decomposition is meaningless. You know, I mean, you still have to know it for the test. When you hit linear algebra and differential equations, there's something called the Laplace transform, which uses the partial fraction decomposition a lot. So let us move to the next problem, which is a pro um, a pro two problems. We'll do two problems from 8.7. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this problem. I'm trying to solve this system of nonlinear equations. To solve this, there are a few ways we can go about this. Um, the way that I'm going to do it is I'm going to eliminate the x squared. Now sometimes you can't do that and you just have to solve for an x or a y in one of the equations and put it back into the other equation. But what I'm going to do on this, I'm going to add those two equations together and I'm going to get these guys. They're out of there. And then 2y squared plus y. This is going to equal 3. Okay, now I have to solve this quadratic equation, bring everything to the left hand side 2y squared plus y minus 3 equals 0. Let's see if this thing factors. Here's a 2y and a y. Um, if I put the 3 right there. And the one right there. Put a plus there and a minus there. Yeah, it does look like it factors. Set each of those factors equal to zero. And on this one, I get y equals one. On this one right here, I get y equals negative one half. So let's go ahead and bring these guys up here. y equals 
negative one half, I'm going to go ahead and throw this into the simpler equation, which is actually the bottom equation because there's not a squared on the y. So when I do that, I end up getting negative x squared plus, ha, look what I did here. There's a three here. This, this is a three right there. This is a three right there. No one's going to even know. Uh oh, there's a negative there. And then this is a three right there. So I'm, I just noticed that too. Okay. Wow. Okay, so I have y equals negative 3 halves, so I have negative x squared plus negative 3 halves equals negative 1. So this says negative x squared equals, let's see, add 3 halves to both sides, and we end up getting 3 halves minus 1, which is 1 half. x squared equals negative 1 half square root property says x equals plus or minus the square root of negative one half. Now we know this is an imaginary number and we're trying to find the real solutions. We're not trying to find things that are imaginary so um, this right here is a dead end. Okay let's try y equals one. I'm going to plug that into the same equation negative x squared plus 1 equals negative 1. So this is negative x squared. Well, if I end up getting another dead end, then the answer is no solution, and those two nonlinear graphs um, do not intersect at any points. And we saw that in lecture. Subtract 1 on both sides. Multiply both sides by negative 1 and use the square root property, we get x equals plus or minus root 2. So this is not a dead end. This one gives me two solutions, root 2, 1, and also negative root 2, 1. Now the purist would actually verify that both of those work in each of these equations. I'll do it verbally. Root 2 squared, that's 2, plus uh, y is 1, 2 plus 2 is 4, and the bottom one will do the same thing because negative root 2 quantity squared is 2 plus 2 is 4, and then the bottom it's going to be the same thing. We're going to have a negative 2, doesn't matter which one you put in there for x, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. So those check out, we end up getting um, are two solutions here. Okay, so we have two solutions, and that's the answer to solving a system of nonlinear equations. We could draw pictures, but we don't really need to draw a picture for this problem. Let's go ahead and do another problem. But don't worry, we will be drawing pictures because um, the next problem has the same two graphs. Look at that has these graphs here, and um, I'm going to go ahead and sketch the solution. We're solving, we're trying to find all the solutions, but the solutions here, they're going to have to be expressed using a graph. And my solutions, um, the intersection points, I'll put them down because it's almost the same problems. I mean, it's, let's see, this is x squared plus 2y squared. There's a 4, and then a negative x squared plus y, and a negative 1. I switch these equations to inequalities. So let's go ahead and this one's going to be more geometric than the last problem which was really algebraic. And then I wrote, wrote the intersection points when those are equations. So how are we going to do this? Let's go ahead and draw the answer right here. So let's go ahead and put a line there and a line right here. Here's x, here's y. We'll have to do these graphs one at a time. I'll do them in different colors. I'm going to go ahead and let's do this one first, the simpler one first. This is 
negative x squared plus y equals negative 1. So this is really going to say y equals x squared minus 1. That happens to be a parabola that gets shifted down one, one point. And so when we do that, a point there and a point there and there, and we can actually plug values in. We don't have to. And this point is up at 2, 3. Yeah, and then we have one over here, negative 2, 3. And before I graph it, this one here is going to be solid. Okay, because it says less than or equal to, as opposed to this one here, which will be dashed. So let's do a solid parabola. Okay, the, uh, the last thing I want to do with this parabola is um, decide where the shading goes. The shading is either going to go inside the parabola or outside the parabola. So I need a test point, my test point. Hopefully this is coming out all right with the grids. It's good enough. The test point is anything that is not on the parabola. Lots of times we like to make it zero, zero, because it's really easy to put that test point in to the inequality and that's where we're going to put it. We're going to put it right here into this inequality. I have negative zero squared plus zero less than or equal to negative one. So this is zero is less than or equal to negative one. Is that true or false? Well, that happens to be false. So zero is not a solution and neither would any point inside the parabola. So where you would shade if this was just a standalone problem would be below the parabola. But I'll just go ahead and put little blue arrows indicating that's where I would shade. Let's go ahead and graph this guy. So we're going to go ahead and draw the equation here. x squared plus 2y squared equals 4. Now I can divide everything in the equation by 4 and realize, oh, I don't have a circle here, I have an ellipse. But instead of like finding, you know, the foci and all the stuff that was associated with ellipses, I'm just going to find the intercepts. So the x-intercept, or intercepts, I get by setting y equal to 0. So I have x squared equals 4 square root property gives me x equals plus or minus 2. And I know that it's going to be centered at 0, 0. Okay? If you divide by 4, you can see. So x-intercepts are um, 2 and negative 2. So technically, I should say they are plus or minus 2. We don't want to write our x-intercepts as vertical lines. And then my y-intercept, um, y-intercepts, I'm going to set x equal to 0, and I get 2y squared equals 4, y squared equals 2, y equals plus or minus root 2. Now, if you've put root 2 on your calculator recently, you'll see that it's about 1.4. So, it's right here, and right here, so negative 1.4. So, this is plus or minus root 2. Now, this graph, because I'm using pen, I have to be careful. This inequality is less than a strict inequality, which means we are going to have a dashed line, which looks like this. So this is an ellipse. There we go. Okay, so I have an ellipse there and a parabola. And um, I have to figure out um, where the shading goes. Does it go in the ellipse or outside the ellipse? So I need a test point that is not on the ellipse. And I can make this test point be 0, 0 as well. I plug it into the inequality. I get 0 squared plus 2 times 0 squared is less than 4. 0 is less than 4, which is true. 
So anything inside the ellipse would have been true and anything outside the ellipse would have been false. So I would be shading inside the ellipse. Um, okay, now we have these points of intersection right here, which happen to be, um, what do they happen to be? 1.4, you know, plus or minus 1.41. They're right here. Those are the points of intersection right there and right there. So, I mean, that kind of lines up with the last problem that we have two points of intersection between the ellipse and the parabola. So the big question is where, where are all the arrows pointing? They're pointing inside the ellipse, but below the parabola. So we've got to go ahead and shade that. Um, and the shading is going to be this area here. And um, when a dash line meets a solid line, we put an open circle. And then I'll go ahead and emphasize the boundary of where the shading is. And then these are dashed lines here. And that is the picture. And I know this seems really abstract, like why are we doing this? Are we art majors now? What is what is happening? Let me label this. This is um, two and this is negative two and this is this is negative root two right there. Um, no, we're not trying to do this because we want pretty pictures to hang our, on the refrigerator, though that's not a bad idea. But because later on, if you're taking more technical classes like game theory or whatever, you might have an objective function that it flies above this. And you might be using calculus to optimize your strategy on how you will play a game. And these are your strategies you can play. I know it sounds really weird, but it is very useful. There's another thing called linear programming that we used to do in this class, but we don't do that anymore just because it was, it was it was going too crazy on this. So that is the answer. That's all the solutions. They, they live inside that area there that shade it. And that completes chapter eight. We have three more sections to cover with examples. And that's what we're going to do now. So 9.1. 9.2 and 9.4. So here is 9.1. This is when we did sequences. So it says write the first four terms of this sequence. So sequences can be written differently and they can start at different numbers. Um, most common starting points are zero and then other examples could start at one. And if you've done your homework, you've seen that. So the first four terms, what well, we're starting at zero here, you're going to find a zero first by plugging it into this formula. So this is kind of like a function and it should remind you of a function because that's what a sequence is when it's written like this. It reminds you of the function maybe f of x equals x squared plus one over x plus one. But we're just going to go ahead and plug the zero in for n. So I have zero squared plus one all over zero plus one. And that's going to give me one for the first term of that sequence. So let's go ahead and find out what a1 is. a1 is 1 squared plus 1 all over 1 plus 1. So this looks like it's 2 on the top and 2 on the bottom, which is 1. a2 don't tell me that's going to be 1. I don't think it's going to. It's going to be 2 squared plus 1 on the top and 2 plus 1 on the bottom. So it looks like we have 5 on the top and 3 on the bottom. A3, we're putting 3 in for n, so we have 3 squared plus 1 all over 3 plus 1. So that's going to be on the top 9 plus 1, which is 10. And on the bottom we have 4. When that reduces, and you should always reduce your fractions, 5 over 2. So when they say write the first four terms, they would be 1, 1, 5 thirds, 
five halves. And of course, this sequence has infinitely many terms. So they, did, they could have said write the first hundred terms or the first million terms, but I think we get the idea. Let's go ahead and do another problem that has the same instructions. Write the first four terms. And so I've just taken some homework problems now. Um, they, they weren't assigned in the homework. They're evens, but I'm just doing them anyway for a few of these. So this sequence starts at zero. The last one was explicit, which means we could find out what A100 was by just putting 100 in the formula. This one is recursive, which means if we want S100, you'd have to know what S99 was. So I, I kind of compared the recursive formulas as stepping stones. And so it's funny because they say find the first four terms there's your first term. You're already 25% of the way done and all you did was put a circle around something. So I'm going to let n equals 0 in this formula. So we have s sub 0 plus 1, which is 1, equals x to the 1 plus s 0. So what does, we know s 0 is 1 so we know that S1 is going to equal X plus 1. So this sequence is not just a sequence of numbers. Now it's a sequence of functions or polynomials for this to be more specific. N equals 1. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to write S2 equals X squared plus S1. So let's just put arrows here to say this is what I did. So S1 happens to be this x plus 1. So S2 is x squared plus S1. This is x plus 1. And some of you might already realize what's happening. You might say, well, this is just telling you to add an x to a power to what you had before. So like this one, I'm going to add to this to get the next one, probably an x to the, you can guess on that one. Um, just make the right guess. So I'm putting n equals 2 into this formula. So this gives me x cubed. That was probably the right guess there, plus s sub 2. So you know, we have subscripts and superscripts all in one problem. That's fun. So this is s, s cubed equals did I say s cubed? s sub 3 equals x cubed plus s2. s2 is this right here. It's probably easy to see what s4 is going to be, but we're, we're only asked to write the first four terms. s4 is just going to be x to the fourth plus this right here. So let's write out the answer nicely. It's kind of a pain to write it all out again. But it's a good habit to get into to write your answer somewhere in an established place. If you're still going to take technical classes, you probably want to do that. There's your answer. Okay, so there, there we have it there. Okay, now let's get to the next kind of problem. This is asking um, is this sequence arithmetic, geometric, or neither? So we have to figure this out. Um, well, arithmetic means I'm adding the same number to get to each term. So let, let's see, if I add 5, and then I add 5, and I add 5, yep, this one is arithmetic. Now, in the homework it said, if it is arithmetic, then find the common, so I'll, I'll, this is a follow-up question, find the common difference, which they label as D. Okay, so find the common difference. Well, the common difference is what you're adding to get to the next one each time and it's always got to be the same number and this common difference is 5. Okay, 
So we have this right here. This should have been a question right here. Um, we, we found out that it was arithmetic. We found the common difference was five. Now there's another follow-up question, okay? So the next follow-up question is find an explicit formula for this. Okay, I'm going to do it the fast way and then I'll do it the textbook way. The fast way is when I see it's arithmetic, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to say a sub n is. I notice the gaps or the common difference is 5. So I'm going to start off with a 5n. Now when I put 1 in here, I get 5. And I put 2 in there, I get 10. It seems like I'm overshooting these guys by 2 each time. So to compensate, I'm going to subtract 2. Then I'll go ahead and I'll put 1 in there and I end up getting 3. I put 2 in there, I get 10 minus 2, which is 8. I put 3 in there, I get 15 minus 2. It looks like I'm on the right track. Now when they ask for an explicit formula, you must also write where your sequence starts at. So n is greater than or equal to 1. And that finishes that follow-up question. So we've already had two follow-up questions. Find the common difference. Find an explicit formula. Um, the textbook way of doing this. Okay, so this is the textbook way. And this is the way a lot of teachers would show. And there's nothing wrong with this way. The textbook way says, and we've derived a formula that gives the nth term of a sequence. It looks like this. A sub n equals a1 plus n minus 1 times d and is greater than or equal to 1. I believe your book doesn't put an a1 there. I think they just put an a, which is the first term. Okay, so you have to say, well, what is the first term? You have to say, look, look a1 is 3, and d, we already know, is 5. We just look right above. We're going to plug that into the formula. a sub n equals 3 plus n minus 1 times 5. a n equals 3. Distribute the 5. So plus 5 n minus 5. a n equals 5 n minus 2. And this is 4 n greater than or equal to 1. Should it be a comma or a semicolon? What do I look like? An English teacher? Um, don't, don't answer that question. So there is the explicit formula. Now, we're going to have another follow-up question. So with the follow-up questions, I'll put these bullets here. So if you're looking back, you go, oh yeah, I remember that. Um, the next follow-up question is this. Um, find the sum. The sum of what? I'm going to go from 1 to 400. I'm going to take this formula here. 5n minus 2. So this gets a little into 9.2 in the book. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start plugging numbers in. Now if I put 1 in, I end up getting 3. I put 2 in, I end up getting 8. Oh look, I'm getting the same numbers, only because that formula was used to generate that sequence. Now this is a series. Series is when you add up some things. And so this is going to just keep going. Now what is the last um, term of this series? Well, it happens to be 400 times 5, and so 400 times 5 minus 2. And so that's going to give me 1,998. And um, I think I'm going to need another piece of paper here. There is a formula for the sum of an arithmetic series and the formula goes like this. 
it goes like n a sub 1 plus a sub n. This is all over 2. Sometimes they put an n there, you know, the sum of the first n terms. And we are summing up how many? We are summing up 400. So n equals 400. So this is going to be 400 a1 plus a sub 400. This is all over 2. Well, we know what a1 is. a1 is this guy. And a400 is this last guy. So let's go ahead and put that in the formula. 400, and then we have 3 plus 1998. This is all over 2. Okay, so this equals 1998 um, plus 3 is 2001. And then we have 400. This is all over 2. I'm going to go ahead and say 400 divided by 2 is 200. So 100 times that's going to add two zeros. 200 times that's going to multiply it by two. So I'm going to get 400,200. And think about it. I mean, this is a lot easier than putting 400 terms into your calculator. And so that is how we do this. Let's go take a look at another problem. Remember the original problem said is the sequence, because they gave you a sequence, is it arithmetic, geometric, or neither? Let's go to the next problem. So look at that. I have some fractions there. So it might, looks, I could be subtracting one. Let's see, three halves minus two halves gives me one half. And then if I subtract one again, I should be at negative one half. Oh, it's not arithmetic. Is it geometric? Let's see, um, what can I multiply by three halves to get one half? Or maybe you can work from here to here. It looks like I'm multiplying by one third each time because multiply that by one third, the threes go away. Multiply that by one third, I get one sixth. Multiply this by one third, it's just like you're multiplying the bottom by three. And so, wow, I'm multiplying by one third each time. So this right here is geometric. This is a geometric sequence. Sequence because there's the commas, we're not adding anything up. But you know I'm going to ask some follow-up questions. So the first follow-up question is find the common ratio. So that's, you know, like with the arithmetic sequences, we had something called D. The geometric ones, we have these things called, well, this thing called R, which is the thing you're multiplying each time, which we found out was one third. Okay, a follow up question. Okay, find an explicit formula. Okay, so how am I going to find this explicit formula? Well, one way is to try to do it the quick way. And um, some of you probably just want to do it the textbook way, but I'm going to try to show you. We have the one third, which is our R, so I'm going to go one third to the N. And what does that give me? Well, it gives me one third right away. Um, so I'm really off. I mean, my first term is three halves, not one third. So I'm going to go ahead and throw a one half in front. And now my first term is one half times one third if n starts at one. 
um, I really don't want that. So I'm going to have to tweak the exponent so I end up getting this thing to be, put a 3 on the top. And so if n is 1, maybe if I went minus 2, let's see if I put 1 in there, I end up getting 1 third to the negative 1, which is 3, 3 halves. And if I put 2 in there, this thing is just 0 power, and so you just have 1 half. And if I put 3 in there, I have 1 half times 1 third to the 1, which gives me 1 sixth. Now, for geometric series, it's a little trickier to do what I just did. Okay, The more you work with these, the better you get at it. So let's go ahead and do it the textbook way. I think people are going to want to see it that way. So this is the textbook way. And um, the textbook way says we have a formula which gives you the nth term for a geometric sequence. It looks like this. a sub n equals a 1 r to the n minus 1. n is greater than or equal to 1. So in our example, our first term is a1. a1 is 3 halves. Our r, we're just looking right above, is 1 third. So let's go ahead and write out this formula. a sub n equals a1, which is 3 halves, times r to the n minus 1 power. Now usually when you have a formula like this, I'll probably just accept something like that on the exam, but Really, you got to be careful before you, <laughs> you hit a teacher that might not like this because there's a 3 here and a 3 here. Really what you have, so you have a 1 half out front. On the top you have a 3 to the 1 power. And on the bottom, I mean 1 to the n minus 1 is always going to be 1. But on the bottom you have a 3 to the n minus 1 power. So you could say that this 3 will cancel with one of those 3's and you end up getting, I mean you can do the subtraction of exponents, but you're going to end up getting um, 1 over 3 to the n minus 2 power. That is what you're going to get. Okay, You could do cross the line change the sign and then this 1 becomes a negative 1 and it goes down there and you add them. Well in any case See this right here, what I got? That's exactly this. Okay, so we found our formula um, using the textbook way. Okay, now I think I'm going to have a follow-up question. Here's the last follow-up question. I'm going to ask you to use the formula to find this right here. Summation n equals 1 to 8 and then this formula right here is the one we've been looking at. 1 half times 1 third to the n minus 1. Um, write your answer as a fraction as a fraction. Okay, so I think I need another piece of paper for this. There is a formula that we derived. So now this is going a little into 9.2, which is the sum of um, arithmetic, no, geometric series. And the formula I believe it goes like this. S sub n is a 1, 1 minus r to the n all over 1 minus r. Now in r, r, <laughs> so we can write out a few of these terms and if you did you would end up getting, you know, 3 halves plus 1 half plus 1 sixth and that would um, go 
for eight terms. Okay, so that's how you would do that. Um, we identify our A1. Our A1 is three halves. You identify the R. The R happened to be one third. You also identify the N. And N in this, how many are you adding up? You're adding eight of these terms up. So N is eight. So now we're going to plug these numbers into this formula and have lots of fun doing some arithmetic. So let's do that. So A1 is 3 halves. And we have 1 minus R to the N, to the 8th. This is all over 1 minus R. Okay, so I have 3 halves inside the parentheses. I'm going to write this as 3 to the 8th over 3 to the 8th. And this one's going to be minus 1 to the 8th, which is 1, and then 3 to the 8th. Meanwhile, on the bottom, I have 2 thirds. Okay, so we have 3 to the 8th. 3 to the 8th is when you go 3 times 3 times 3, and you do it 8 times. So, let's go ahead and we have 3 halves. This is really 65, 61, minus 1, all over. 65, 61. This is all over 2 thirds. I'm going to go ahead and do a copy dot flip. So this is copy dot flip. I'll go put this guy over here near this guy. So I'm going to flip this. This is going to be 3 over 2. And then this gives me 65, 60. all over 65, 61. And 9 does go into that. So these guys are going to cancel with that. That's going to reduce. And then 4 does go into that. So you can do some long division. And so when everything is settled, when you do that, I'm not going to waste a lot of time doing this because I want to do all the other problems here that I have to get done. You're going to get 1640 over 729. And all we're doing is illustrating there is a formula that goes with um, the sum of the first n geometric uh, in terms of a geometric series. So on the test, I'll give to you on some of these pages, I'll give to you this right here. A1 plus and minus 1D. And they'll be kind of mixed up. So maybe the next one, this one over here would be um, A1R to the N minus 1. And then maybe... This one will be the one that I just did. A1, 1 minus R to the N, all over 1 minus R. And then the other one um, was the one that I had done with the other problem, which is N. A1 plus A N. This is all over 2. And I'll give them to you in some mixed up order. Now, because this is a remote learning class and the, the test is open book, you'll see those, but you can also look in your notes or books on in book to see those formulas. So that completes this problem and the follow-up problems. Now we're going to go ahead and ask this question again. Is this arithmetic, geometric, or neither? So we're doing this one right here. Okay, so if I add 3, I get 4, and if I add 3, I get 7. Oh, no, it's not arithmetic. If I multiply by 4, okay, 1 times 4 is 4, 4 times 4 is 16, up oh, but there's a 9 there, you know, and this is not working. So this is going to be neither. 
So there are some problems where they're like that, and then, you know, what do you do? You're done with the problem. Okay, there's a follow-up question. Um, the follow-up question is find an explicit explicit formula. Now, to find the explicit formula, what do those numbers look like to you? Well, to a lot of people, they look like squares. And so this is something you're going to have to recognize if you've done your homework. You've, you've already experienced this. So the explicit formula, a sub n, will be, well, just n squared. And then we have to tell where the starting point is. This is n is greater, I don't know what to do, greater than or equal to 1. And so you can double check yourself, like 1 squared, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9. So that completes that problem. So now we're really getting into 9.2 here when we do um, sums and sigma notation. So this is just asking you to add this up. So the start point is 2. So I have 2 plus 1 times 2 minus 2 factorial plus, now we go up to the next integer, 3, 3 plus 1, 3 minus 2 factorial, and the next integer is 4, so we have 4 plus 1, 4 minus 2 factorial, and then the last one, which I almost don't have room to write, is putting the stopping point, which is 5, so 5 plus 1, and then 5 minus 2 factorial. Okay, so this is just um, adding things up. We have 3 times 0 factorials plus um, 4 times 1 factorial plus 5 times 2 factorial plus 6 times 3 factorial. Now factorials are stronger than multiplication on your order of operations. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally becomes a phrase that has an F in it, so we're not going to say that phrase, but um, factorials are stronger. So if you remember, 0 factorial happens to be 1, and 1 factorial is 1, and what is a factorial? Well, like 3 factorial is just going 3 times 2 times 1, and 2 factorial is 2 times 1, so 2 factorial is going to be 2 times 1, which is 2, and 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, which happens to be 6. So let's add these up. 3 plus 4 plus 10 plus 36. So 46, 47, 48, 59, 50, 50 plus 3 is 53. And there is finding the sum. You've done ones where you get numbers, and also in your homework, you've done ones where you get functions. So let's go ahead and do the next problem. There's like two more things we're going to do. We're going to do this piece of paper, and then we have um, the binomial theorem. So I wanted you to compare these two problems here. Here's a sequence, and it asks you to find an explicit formula. And here is a series. We're adding things together. I know we're adding some negatives. And they want you to rewrite using summation notation. Now, these problems, even though one's a sequence and one's a series, they're going to be very similar. Okay, um, there's going to be differences as well. So let's go ahead and do this one, and then when we're done, we'll find that this one's not so bad to do. Okay. So I'm not going to use the formulas unless I absolutely have to. I do notice on the top a 16, a 25, a 36, a 49, and you might recognize those to be perfect squares. So I'm going to start off my formula by saying a sub n equals, I'm going to put a fraction bar, and I'm going to put each of those terms, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Each of those terms has 
an x to some power. And it has an x to a square. So now, um, if I just went n squared, then when I put 1 in here, I would have x to the 1. And that's not a 1. That's a 16. This is not 1 squared, but it is what? 4 squared. So I need an n plus something squared to match with the 16 when I put n equals 1 in there. So if I put n equals 1, I'm going to need an n plus 3 squared. So if I put n equals 2 in there, I'm going to have x to the, and this is 5 squared, which is 25. And I put a 3 in there. So my sequence is going to start at 1. And that's the formula. So these were squares, but we had to kind of shift it a little to, to start it off right there. Now the bottom, look at this. I subtract 3, I subtract 3, I subtract 3, I subtract 3, I subtract 3. So you can just treat the bottom as its own little sequence. That's an arithmetic sequence on the bottom. I'm going to go ahead and do it the quick way. Since 3 seems to be the common difference, I'm going to put a minus 3 there. 3n, minus 3n. So when I put 1 into there, I end up getting a negative 3. How far is that from 30? <laughs> it's very far. I went too low. So I should, comp I should you know, I undercompensate it. So I'm going to actually add something to get up to 30. So when I put 1 in there, I'm going to have to add a 33. Now, if you don't like how I just did this, go ahead and do that formula that we did. Uh, what was it? I don't know what it was. It was the one where it was a1 plus n minus 1 times d. But I'm going to say, okay, whether you did it that way or did it the way I just did it, that is a legitimate formula. You put 1 in there, look what happens. 33 minus 3 is 30. You put 2 in there, you get negative 6 plus 33, which is 27. And you can check the other terms. Now, I left a little space because I can see there's a minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. So this is the light switch we were talking about. I'm going to put a negative 1, and I always start off by saying negative 1 to the n and see if that takes care of it. If I put n equals 1 in there, I end up getting a negative. This thing's going to be a negative number. Is that what we have? Yes. Now, the one we did in lecture, it wasn't good enough because we had to put a plus 1 there to adjust it because we hung our light switch upside down. But in this one, that is very acceptable. Okay, let's go ahead and compare and contrast this problem with this one here where we're trying to rewrite using summation notation. So summation notation, we're going to go summation, and I'll use n, n equals 1. That's kind of where we started here. Now, how many terms do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 6. Now, here's the sweet part. This formula was able to capture each of these, these terms of the sequence. Well, it will capture each of these terms of the series as well. Watch, I'm going to just throw it right into this formula here. all over negative 3n plus 33. So look, if I put 1 in there, look what I end up getting. Negative x to the 16th all over 30. That's the first term there. Now look, if I put 2 in there, I get positive 1. So I get a positive, positive, um, 2 in there. Um, that's a 25. So x to the 25th, 33 minus 6, which is 27. And you can check all of these. When I put 6 into the formula, look what happens. That's a positive. And then I have 6 plus 3, which is 9. 9 squared is 81. So x to the 81. And then 6 over here. This is 33 minus 18, which is 15. So I just wanted to put some side by side so you can see, wow, it's kind of the same skill like in 9.1 when they ask you to find an explicit formula. It's, there's a lot of the same skills used to rewriting using summation notation. Now, if you are taking calculus too, this is going to be um, very important. Okay, even calculus one, there is 
summation notation but calculus too you see a lot of it let's go ahead and do our last problem this will finish the review use Pascal's triangle to expand so some of the problems ask you to expand and some say hey um, what is the term that has like an X to the fourth in it and then of course if you know how to do this you'll know how to do those other ones Pascal's triangle starts off with ones down the sides now anything that's internal you get by adding the two numbers right above it so one plus one is two so ones down the sides then we have um, 1 plus 2 is 3, 3. So the next row, we call this row that I'm working on right now row 4 because the second entry is 4, with the first row up here being row 0. So 1, 4, 3 plus 3 is 6. And then we have 4, 1, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1, 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, six one we stop there this is the row that we want it is row six and we see a six there so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out these numbers but in a vertical fashion one six fifteen twenty fifteen six one what I'm really doing is something called the binomial theorem but really we just have to show you how to do the problems this way this will be good enough now the, the our first character which is this guy right here x squared he's fully powered up he's fully alive and as you move down the line he is slowly dying it's actually rather sad to see this happening he's like i'm dying I mean, he might be yelling help which is actually even sadder and he is dying out and then i'm not even gonna write that there um, it's x, whoops, this is an x squared, x squared to the 0, which is just a 1. So we don't have to write that there. Now, this negative 2 is completely dead here, and he comes to life there. So negative 2 to the 1, negative 2 to the 2, negative 2 to the 3, negative 2 to the 4, negative 2 to the 5 and negative 2 to the 6. For all you um, perfectionists or you know purists or whatever, I'll go ahead and write these ones. This is x squared to the 0 and then this is negative 2 to the 0. Those guys are just 1. So now to write out the final answer, you just you just consider each column. If there's a negative there, we, we talked about this in the lecture, your signs are going to alternate between plus, minus, plus, with the first one being plus in this example. So this is an x to the 12th. Then we have minus, and so we have an x to the 10th there. So you're going to see a pattern with the x's really quickly. And we have minus 12 x to the 10th. And then plus, now I have to go 15 times, let's see, negative 2 quantity squared, 15 times 4. 15 times 4 is 60. 60 x to the 8th. Okay, the next one's going to be minus. I'm going to go, what am I doing here? I'm going to go 8. So this is a negative 8, but so 8 times 20 is 160. So this is 160 x to the 6th. Okay, so, so far I've done, I should be circling them as I do them, I've done those. Now I'm going to do this one right here, so this is really going to be 16 times 15, which is actually a pretty cruel thing to do without a calculator, but it can be done. And so when you go 15 times 16, you're going to get a positive number, you'll get 240 x to the fourth so that was cruel if you didn't have a calculator that one's done now look at this one this one's 32 or negative 32 so negative 32 times 6 so negative 32 times 6 is, is 190 I think 2 this is going to be x squared so that completes that one and this one's not going to be as intense it's going to be negative 2 to the 6th power so it's a positive and that's like 8 times 8, which is 64. So we've used Pascal's triangle to expand 
a binomial meal that's to a power. And so that's what this binomial meal theorem says. Now, is there a three dimensional generalization of Pascal's triangle? Absolutely, Pascal's tetrahedron. And um, that will give you the coefficients if you take a trinomial to a power. It's usually not um, seen in math books, but there are always higher dimensional things with, with the stuff that we work with. Well, usually higher dimensional things. Well, um, this is the last video. We finished the review. Study hard for your test and have a good day.